Risk. What is it? How do you identify it? How do you control it? What level of risk are you willing to accept? When we decide to fly, we are accepting risk. The same is true for driving a car, taking a bus, riding a bicycle, or walking across a busy street. Much of what we do involves risk. Hazards are present in our daily lives and with them are inherent risks. Am I making a wise decision? We all have a little voice inside our head that may tell us, that doesn't look right, or that asks us, is this action that I'm about to undertake safe? In some cases, the voice may inform us, this is a very stupid thing to do. In life, we usually have the correct answer stored in our memory, which will lead us to the safest course of action. However, when we are subject to the dynamic and complex environment of aviation, the little voice inside our head may need some assistance. By relying on regulations, training, and being current in our skills, we are given the much-needed guidance in answering the question, is this a wise decision? At times, the risk is such that avoiding it may be the only right way of dealing with it. But we cannot always decide simply to stay on the ground or to leave the car in the garage. Living requires that we manage risk by learning to make good decisions. What is risk? By definition, risk is the combination of a specific hazard and the likelihood that it will occur. Risk can be measured by the likelihood or probability multiplied by how often the hazard is encountered. The severity, or consequences, of the risk allows you to assess its level. For example, aircraft accidents can be expressed by one accident per million flights and can be quantified through loss of life or financial loss. If we perceive something to be scary, painful, or unknown, it should be avoided at all costs. This is the notion of self-preservation. For most of us, putting ourselves into harm's way goes against our instinct for self-preservation and therefore constitutes an unnecessary risk. Okay, now it's time to try some spins. Geez, I don't know, are these really necessary? No, but it's safe to do when you practice them properly and they're really good experience for you. Well, you know, I'm really not that confident about doing it. Okay, as we enter the stall, I need you to add full right rudder. Hey, that wasn't so bad after all. The flight instructor demonstrated to the student pilot that while spins are something to be avoided at all costs, Spin recovery is an important skill for students to possess and helps them to gauge when a spin would become a necessary risk. Full right rudder. Spin recovery is well within the instructor's comfort level or their personal risk parameters. The student, having never tried a spin recovery, is operating outside of his comfort level and looks at this particular lesson as an unnecessary risk. Upon recovery from the spin, the student realizes that he now has the ability to recover the aircraft. The risk manager, or in this case the instructor, sees that the student is better prepared in the event that this should happen in the future. However, the instructor points out to the student how much altitude is lost during the recovery and informs the student of the risk of performing the maneuver at too low an altitude. While in training, a student pilot's risk is managed by lesson plans and the supervision of the instructor. Once the student becomes a licensed pilot, they are not as constrained and are likely to encounter more risks in flight. They may encounter weather that they've never experienced, 
they may fly more advanced aircraft, and they may undertake more complex trips that are longer in duration and require flying over unfamiliar terrain. Eventually, they will gain experience, but early on, new pilots may not even recognize some of the hazards. They will not have acquired the rule-based behavior patterns of a more experienced pilot. The student's lack of experience results in an inability to deal with high-risk situations. In the decision-making process, assessment of risk is an assessment of probability. For example, given the deteriorating weather, what is the probability that it will get worse, get better, or stay the same? Obtaining more information through contacting a flight service station can help a pilot refine their estimate of what will happen, but it still amounts to the ability to gauge probability. The same assessment is made when you contemplate a particular action. If I do A, what is the likelihood that B will happen or could C or D happen? How well you estimate the odds depends on many things. In fact, all the same factors that influence pilot decision making also influence one's ability to predict possible outcomes. Flying is a continuous process of decision making. It involves the pilot, the aircraft, and the environment in which the flight is taking place. Most decisions we make are based on short-term and long-term memories. Short-term memories are based on what we see and hear on a daily basis and are quickly lost. If information needs to be accessed time and again, it will more likely be stored into long-term memory and this is typically accomplished through repetition or training. Additionally, maintaining currency in the aircraft affects long-term memory and should be an important consideration. For example, a pilot and a passenger are flying towards a thunderstorm. The pilot notes that the storm is nearly five miles away and decides to press on. The passenger, upon hearing this information, becomes uncomfortable with that decision and wonders if they should turn back. Both individuals are in the same situation, yet the pilot decides that it is safe, determining it a low-risk situation. How is it that they view the level of risk so differently? Because both are drawing from past experiences stored in their long and short-term memories. The pilot has been in the situation before and knows it to be safe and low risk. The passenger may be remembering some thunderstorms he experienced on the ground and found it to be a not too pleasant experience and relates it to the current flight situation. Their perception of risk is different and they must communicate this to one another openly to aid the passenger in feeling more at ease. There are four primary factors that can reduce the probability of risk. They are awareness, attitude, supervision, and training. Where have you been? Where are you now? And where are you going? If you can answer these three questions before taking action, in flight and in life, you will most likely be able to avoid a major disaster. Awareness is achieved by pilots becoming more cognizant of their surroundings. Forward thinking and planning are required to have an understanding of risk and the liabilities associated with flying. A pilot's attitude has a direct correlation to the level of risk that they're willing to accept. A pilot's reputation, crew and passenger expectations, disciplinary issues, job security, and ego can be a part of the equation of a pilot's attitude toward decision-making and their level of risk acceptance. Supervision acts as a control to minimize risk. This can be as simple as a manager ensuring that approved cockpit procedures are being followed. However, with privately owned aircraft, the pilot is the supervisor and manager. They provide their own oversight. While following all the rules and regulations can help a pilot self-assess, 
it must be realized that they are the ones responsible for policing their own personal, physiological, and psychological state to ensure that they are not the major risk to having a safe flight. Just because you may not be a professional pilot does not mean you should not try to fly like one. Obtain as many certifications and gain as much training as possible. With more training, you are more likely to conduct a more accurate risk assessment of yourself and your environment. A professional approach is a risk reducer. Every flight requires forethought and planning placing further emphasis on the importance of flight preparation. To reduce or minimize the negative consequences of an event is where the concept of risk management comes into play. In general aviation, this term is frequently used in the context of making decisions about how to best handle situations that affect the safety of flight. Risk management is the process of identifying hazards, assessing risks, making a decision, implementing the decision, and monitoring the results. Being able to manage risk effectively reflects a decision in good management. Risk management is the ability to identify and control risks according to a set of preconceived parameters. But who sets these parameters, and why are they important? Parameters can be set from a variety of sources, such as the FAA, the organization, management, the flight crew, the pilot in command, or PIC, as well as others. It is predominantly the PIC that is responsible for setting the risk parameters and is the key component for preventing accidents. One primary objective of this training is to assist pilots in being able to recognize the risk associated with their aviation operation and how to set their own personal risk parameters. It's true that what one pilot would consider to be an unacceptable risk would be different for another pilot who has the past experience, knowledge, and skill for that situation. Much can be gained by simply listening and observing others and how they relate to risk every day, experiencing common situations in an aviation environment. History has repeatedly demonstrated the importance of having all crew members share the same perception of risk. This is a key step in risk management. Consult and involve the people who will be affected by the decision-making process. Having everyone on the same sheet of music gives everyone a common frame of reference. This is of vital importance in the aviation environment where there is so much to lose. The GAR model is a common risk management tool. The green, amber, and red, representing G-A-R, helps determine different levels of risk. This model is commonly used by the U.S. Coast Guard in high-risk operations of search and rescue. The Coast Guard has identified six elements that affect the potential level of risk. They are supervision, planning, crew selection, crew fitness, the environment, and flight complexity. While this model is a viable tool in risk assessment and management, the true importance is that it creates a shared understanding of the potential risk. Additionally, open communication allows for exploring ways that risk can be managed. Even if you don't have a risk management tool, such as the GAR model, you can use the six levels of risk management to help evaluate your flight during the preparation phase. With supervision, consider the type, quality, and quantity of the organization and crew supervision, the means of cross-checking and monitoring of information. If you are a private pilot, you are the supervisor. Have you established standard operating procedures and guidelines? Do you have an effective checklist for your operation? These procedures will help aid in accountability when it comes to assessing risk. 
When considering planning, do you make time available for the amount of preparation needed for the flight? Is the important information current and available? Spending time in pre-flight planning will help one to counter risk. If you are planning a trip that risks you flying at night, when you are not qualified to do so, try planning backwards from the goal. For instance, If I want to arrive at my destination before dark, I will have to depart before 4 p.m. If I am not airborne before this time, I will not 